care about that. And we're very happy to have uh, Robert Weston from Parrot Wood, and he'll tell us about Baxter's key operator for open quantum spin chain. Yep. So, well, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm you know, sorry I can't be there in person. It would be far nicer. Um, so, so as I was saying, it, it's, please interrupt me because uh, staring into total silence is not very appealing. So stop me at any point. Okay, so uh, yeah, I wanna talk, so I wanna talk about Bax's Q operator for open quantum spin chains. And um, this is where I want to be right now, which is in the Isle of May, but actually I'm stuck in my bedroom as I have been for the last three months. So. But hopefully it will get out soon. Okay, so first of all, I wanna, okay, so this is a representation theory uh, and mathematical physics seminar. But this, the bad news is that the first, this, this, this part of the talk is actually entirely linear algebra. So there are two ways of trying to give this talk. One is to introduce all the representation theory and then sort of drive the necessary linear algebra relations. But I find that quite hard to do. So I'm actually gonna set it up in this very general language of linear algebra and then bear with me, you'll get to the representation theory eventually. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so if you wanna turn off your cameras and go and have a cup of tea and come back in 35 minutes, that's when the representation theory will start. And I'll never know. It's the good thing about it. Okay, so, f so first of all, I want to talk about some really general characterizations of what transform matrices and Q operators are for quantum integrable systems. And um, then I want to talk about the necessary components for building those things for closed and open quantum spin chains. And in particular, I want to, uh, so the Q operator is something that's useful because it obeys certain relations with the T operator, which are called TQ relations, usually, or Baxter relations, but that's, there are so many Baxter relations around, it's maybe better to call them TQ relations. So the TQ relations are basically associated with the idea of fusion. So I want to introduce that in terms of linear algebra first, uh, and um, show you how T and Q are built. But then, I have, you know, of course, all this stuff comes from uh, quantum groups. So, so eventually, I want to talk about uh, how all the various components that I've already built up come out naturally in terms of quantum groups and co-ideal subalgebras of quantum groups. Okay. Robert, and when you say fusion, do you mean some like fusion tensor product or? Yes, yeah. So fusion is about taking tensor products and looking at short exact sequences. Yep, so finding submodules and uh, quotients and uh, using that structure to construct uh, R matrices and other objects for more complicated uh, spaces in terms of tensor products of simpler ones. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's my really, really general characterization of a transfer matrix. Okay. So this is really, this is really just linear algebra that I'm doing this stuff. With. So I've got, a, I've got an, an operator, uh, Tz, uh, and it lives you know, in endomorphisms of a vector space, M. And it depends upon this complex uh, parameter z. Okay. And it's got two key prop, well, so three key properties. The first is it's it, um, it's going to be diagonalizable and entire as a function of z, so no poles. And the second is uh, this property that it commutes with itself at different values of z. Okay. And as a consequence of that, well, the eigenvectors are Z independent, okay? Because these different uh, T at different Z values, they share eigenvectors. And, that, and that's, this T is gonna be the thing that characterizes a quantum integrable system. So it's the transfer matrix of a quantum integrable system. And, you know, the prime directive in quantum integrable systems is to find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the transfer matrix. You know, there are maybe lots of other things you want to do as well, but uh, basically this is the starting point. And if you want to do those other things, you're not going to be able to do them unless you can do this to start off with. So you might want to calculate correlation functions or, as well. The first job is to look at the transfer matrix or the Hamiltonian and diagonalize it to find its eigenvectors and eigenvalues. 
And there are kind of two standard routes to doing that. Um, one is the algebraic beta and zats, or beta and zats in general, or in its different forms. But the other one was introduced by Baxter in 1972 uh, for, in order to solve the eight vertex model. So the problem with the eight vertex model is there isn't a beta and zats for the eigenstates. And so Baxter couldn't use this standard technique. Um, so he ingeniously introduced this new auxiliary operator, which is conventionally called Q. Okay. So what are the, what are the properties of Q? Well, Q is another linear operator that depends upon Z. And it's, first of all, it's diagonalizable and it's polynomial. Okay, so these are the properties, the general properties of Q. And then a bit like the transfer matrix, it commutes with the transfer matrix of different values of Z. So you know, T and Q commute at different values of Z. And Q commutes with itself as well. Okay, and then importantly, and its real kind of use is that it satisfies this relation down here uh, with the T operator. And that's what is gonna be, I'm calling the TQ relation. Okay, so this is an operator relation where alpha and beta are some complex numbers and A and B are meromorphic functions. So why, why do you introduce this object? And it's, well, it's because of the final bullet point here. So this is diagonalizable. So let's write down, uh, write in small letters on a particular eigenvalue, simultaneous eigenvalue of t's and q's. So, so there's an eigenvector and its eigenvalues are little t and little q, of big t and big q. So it's polynomial, but, so we can write QZ in terms of its, its roots, okay? So then I just plug that into this equation here and write down the analogous equation for the eigenvalues. And so then if I choose in here Z to be equal to ZJ, then the, um, um, because T is entire, this means that the product of T and Q has to be zero at this value. And so the right hand side has to be zero as well. Okay. So if I take a zero of Q, and then a consequence of this is the right hand side of this is zero. And when I write that out, that's this relation down here. Robert, and may I ask yep. something? Uh, so I, I'm forgetting a little in this, X, X, Z chain. Uh, so T is just the, the trace of the two by two monodromy matrix, right? Yeah. Well, or a product of. Right. Uh, and, and can you do, and does Q has to do anything with monodromy matrix or is it completely auxiliary? T is, um, well, okay. T is going to be the monodromy matrix traced over an infinite dimensional auxiliary space. Right. And Q. As opposed to a two dimensional auxiliary space whose trace gives the transfer matrix. Sure. That's the general idea. Uh -huh. so, so it's a similar object algebraically to the uh, transfer matrix, but the representations you take the trace over are different. Okay. And U is independent of this uh, monodromy matrix. It's a, it's a separate thing. Well, sorry, what is? So, so you explain what T is now. And, oh, and... oh, no, sorry. I explained both T and Q, and I attempted to, and ah. obviously failed. So T is a trace of the monodromy mon matrix over the auxiliary space, uh -huh. usually as finite dimensional representations. Q is a trace over um, uh, representations, infinite dimensional representations okay. of that auxiliary space. We got it, yeah. Thank you. I also fact, have was, a... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I don't know, please finish. No, no, I've, I've, I've finished. Ah, cool. Yeah, I also had a question. Um, so typically in the applications to quantum systems, the um, vector space M comes with some kind of unitary structure, some inner product, and normally the, the T of Z, if, if Z is real at least, is going to be self-rejoined. Um, yep. is, is the Q going to be um, unitary or self-rejoined as well, or does it have any nice kind of rejoinedness properties? 
Um, it's normal. Normal, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be diagonalized. It commutes with its. Okay. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, it depends on the model. I don't have any general I statements see, about see. that. Sure. Thanks. Okay. And Robert, for your for your talk, you're considering SO two, right? Yeah, at the moment the I'm not considering any. Of the, yeah, but the structure yes. of the TQ oh, yes. relation no, that, that's, that's will right. always yes. so, be this no, two that's, terms. That's right. So I'm choosing a implicitly. I'm choosing SL two at the moment. The, the structure will differ for the other ranks. So I'm talking about the simplest. Okay. Way. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Then? So, so you end up with these relations down here. Oops. Yeah, the, uh, these relations. And uh, so these are the beta equations. And there are the beta equations for these ZJs. So this is a set of coupled nonlinear equations. And so you've still got a job. You've got to solve these equations, uh, but it's a lot easier than trying to diagonalize uh, T directly. So once you, you, the point is you solve these relations, it then gives you an eigenvalue of, um, well, it gives you this object Q, and it also tells you T through this, the eigenvalue through this relation. Okay, so it tells you uh, the eigenvalues of T. So you've shifted the problem from diagonalizing T to um, understanding uh, these zeros, the poles of, uh, oh, sorry, the solutions of this equation for these sets of roots. It always seems slightly miraculous to me, this process, but you know, you've, you've changed the problem and you've, you've transformed it into this other problem here. And, uh, and that's the kind of starting point for most, the study of most integral systems is to solve beta equations. And as I've said, for lots of models, there's a standard algebraic approach to uh, write, writing down such beta equations that has nothing to do with these Q operators. Um, but not for every model, and in particular, not for the eight vertex model, or at least if you don't map it to another model where you can do it, as was later done. All right, so I'm moving on. That's the kind of standard picture of beta equations of what we've got to do with Q. Okay, so now T and Q specifically for open, for quantum spin chains. So, and again, at the moment, this is all linear out, okay? So I've got two vector spaces. Later on, these are gonna turn into various algebra modules, but at the moment, they're just vector spaces, V and W. And um, I've got a linear operator that maps uh, from V tends to W to W tends to V. And of course, there's a vector space and I can identify W tends to V with V tends to W, but I want to leave that there for the moment in that language. And then of course, what you want, it's gonna, this is an R matrix as you all know. So I'm gonna use the standard um, um, you know, pictures of the R matrix because pictures help enormously. So my R matrix is this, and I've got you know, over or under now to do, because I don't wanna necessarily identify the inverse uh, with the R matrix swapped around. Okay, so I want to uh, distinguish between the R matrix and the inverse. I don't want to identify those at the moment. Okay, so then diagrammatically, this relation R times R inverse uh, diagrammatically looks like this, where the right-hand side corresponds to the identity. And this R matrix is chosen to satisfy the Young-Baxter equation, which as you all know is this. And um, so then you choose, uh, so the transfer matrix, so M is another, this M is another vector space. And then the transfer matrix is uh, associated with the vector space V is a trace of our VM over V. And so it's a map from M to itself. So in the usual terminology, V is the um, um, uh, auxiliary space and M is the quantum space. Um, okay. So, so much, so good. So then of course, the Young-Baxter equation is, uh, gives you these commutation relations between the T's. And it's just a diagrammatic relation using the R matrix and its inverse. Okay. So you pull up a thing and you, you pull it through and you, you know, know this argument. And then, so 
I'm not there yet, but loosely, just as a, you know, this is to answer Sasha's question. So what are T and Q? T and Q are going to be traces uh, over um, um, uh, of our matrices that uh, over um, these auxiliary spaces. One of them is going to be a two-dimensional auxiliary space in the simple SL2 case. And the other one is going to be some infinite dimensional vector, vector space. So uj is just some basis. And so this is some infinite dimensional vector space. That's the general picture. And then because I, I have the young baxter equation, this automatically gives us these commutation relations. They're just particular choices of transfer matrices. Okay. But that's only part of the properties of T's and Q's. You know, also I need that there's this particular Z dependence. I need polynomiality, I need diagonalizability, and I need most importantly this relation down here. And to understand the Z dependence and the other um, uh, properties associated with that Z dependence, we need to be much more concrete. And that, that'll come out later on. All right. Everybody happy so far? Oh, I'm happy. Good, good. Okay, so then that's closed chains. What about open chains? Well, open chains, again, it's linear algebra. So what you're going to do, introduce, sorry, is another linear operator. And this linear operator max from V to another uh, a vector space to another vector space V bar. And often you can identify these, but not always. Okay. So this is a, a map from one vector space to another. And you represent it as this object here. And then there's an, another one, which I've called, well, I've got K plus does that. And K minus is a, is a maps the other way around. And that's represented in this way. Okay, so they're just two linear operators. So then the transfer matrix in this case, and this is due to Sklianin, is given by this expression, which is much easier to understand diagrammatically. And so it's a product of an R matrix up here, which is here, then I've got a K matrix, then I've got this other R matrix, and then I've got this other K matrix here. Okay, so it's a product of, so I'm, I'm composition follows the arrows. And this is, this is a product of four objects, which I can represent in this. And M is just some other vector space. And if you're interested in quantum spin chains, typically M will be a tensor product of some finite dimensional representations. Okay, so this is the double row transfer matrix of Sklianin. And um, so Sklianin introduced this in order to get uh, an object that was comparable with tran the transfer matrix that defined a quantum integrable system. So we wanted the transfer matrices to commute. And um, so this, the idea here is the following. So for commutivity of TV and TW, where TW is some other vector space, so it replaces this blue space here. I'm going to um, consider the note the following. So first of all, um, well, I'm going to define in the usual way R in terms of R check, but P is the permutation operator that swaps the two spaces around. So then I can always, if the trace exists, uh, I can write uh, this statement. Remember, R was invertible. I, uh, and um, I'm going to write that in a slightly funny way in terms of this new operator, which has a little dot in it that I define as this. So this, I haven't done anything yet. All I've done is written the identity out in terms of a, a, a partial. Oh, so T1 is the partial transpose in the first space. So then I, I have this and I need its inverse, but this object is created, constructed to be the inverse of this. Okay, so it's a slightly bizarre thing to do. And I want to introduce another new diagrammatics for this new R matrix, which is like the old diagrammatics, but I have to distinguish it. So I've got a little blob here. Okay, so that's my new diagrammatics, but it's just given in terms of the old R matrix through this object. So then um, I can take this expression and I can write it diagrammatically using the diagrammatics I've introduced. And if I do that, it looks like this relation here diagrammatically. So when you first see these, it takes a bit of getting used to, but the point is a partial transpose 
corresponds to reversing the direction of one of the lines in the diagrammatics. So if I just had these two arrows in the same direction, um, this would be R times R inverse is the identity. But because of this transpose here, uh, this written out um, diagrammatically corresponds to this with a reversed arrow. And I, uh, it's always hard to describe this in words, this thing, but all you need to do is you need to take components of this relation and then draw it out and you see it just cor corresponds exactly with this. So the point is, I, by introducing this uh, dotted operator, uh, I, I can write down this kind of, um, I can pull opposite direction lines through each other. And you've, you've, you've probably, you've all seen something like this before, but normally you assume crossing symmetry in this argument, such that the blob operator is related to the unblob operator in a natural way. But that's a consequence of crossing symmetry, but it isn't necessary for this argument. So all you need is Yang-Baxter and boundary Yang-Baxter to make this commutivity work. Anyway, so I've got this relation that looks like this. So then, then it's this question of diagrammatics and that's the diagrammatics that show that these two things commute. So you've got these um, TW and TVs and um, uh, composition follows the direction of the arrows. So what you do is you pull the bottom one through here using this blob thing. And then you pull the top one up using the standard inverse thing. And then you do exactly the same, but the other way around. Uh, so the first step here is just this. So this is just the colored, the oppositely colored version of this. And then you pull this thing through here using the standard relation. And so these two things commute if these two right hand sides are the same. And a sufficient requirement for that is I can pull this blob through down to here. And that's the reflection equation. And I have this dual version of the reflection equation that involves this dotted operator. Robert, but, yeah. but you could introduce this dotted operators even without reflection, even without this operator k, right? You just think that, that yeah. doesn't give us anything new, right? But with... No, it doesn't give us anything n new, but, um, um, but in, for, the, for the, the point of introducing this is that it's the dotted operator that occurs in this left reflection equation to give this. Mm -hmm. So in, if you look in the original papers by Scanon, again, he assumes crossing symmetry and the dotted operator is related to the undotted operator with a shift, but you don't need that. So there's no extra assumption that's required. Thank you. So these things commute if we have this reflect right and this left reflection equation. And those reflection equations occur in Scanon, but they also occur in Chorednik in 1994 paper. Okay, um, um, type B and C hecky out of it. I'm sorry, my last question. So yes. uh, I, I'm kind of, I'm not familiar with this stuff, but I just saw recently, I was recently introduced to this reflection equation and it has kind of completely different form. Some of our matrices were tran transposed and something. It, at least it looked differently what's written here. What is the connection? Uh, well, I think it's, it's simply, um, well, this, you see, this is already transposed in here. I mean, oh, it's not operating. So there is a transpose sitting in there already. Mm -hmm. Okay. On the, on the left one. So dot is approximately is this transpose. Yeah, so dot is a, has inverses and transposes built in. Ah, okay. Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, good. So it, I, I think it's what you've seen before. But, yeah, yeah. But, but so, 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 did you even think of K as like R1 to R21, something like that? K as what? Sorry, the... you, you could also cook K from from two R matrices, evaluated in representation, right? Or MIT. Um, there are folding techniques for obtaining Ks from. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, we're we're also probably transposed is involved. I'm, I'm forgetting a little. Uh, I don't know. This is too general. I know in particular cases, you can construct K matrices from folding R matrices, but it's not a completely general. Mm -hmm. Construction. All right. So that's what you need. Okay, fusion. So now, now you know we forget all this. We just this is a linear algebra class now. So now we've got a short exact sequence of vector spaces. Let's remind remind you how this works. Okay. So here's my short exact sequence. I've got an injection and I've got a surjection, and these are just linear maps. And phi b is going to be a linear operator on b. Okay. Well, 
short exact sequences of vector spaces split. You know, later on, I'm going to introduce short exact sequences of algebra modules, and they don't always split, but short exact sequences of vector spaces do split. And I can write the trace of B as the trace over A and the trace over C of, of this operator, where this object is the inverse, the left inverse of the injection, which exists. And this is the right inverse of the subjection. Okay, so this is just linear algebra. This, I'm not doing anything fancy here. Uh, so I can write the trace of a B in terms of the trace of A and the trace of a C with these um, uh, left inverses and right inverses sitting. Okay. So now suppose I have uh, this relation that phi B, uh, Eota followed by phi B can be written in terms of a new operator that acts a linear operator on A is followed by Eota. That needn't be true, and a necessary condition for it to be true is that phi B preserves the image of um, Iota, because the right-hand side is in the image of Iota, so the left-hand side better be in the image of Iota. So I need that phi B preserves the image. In other words, I need that phi B is upper triangular. Okay, so this B space uh, has the image of A in it, and I want phi to preserve that image. So it's upper triangular. And then suppose I have this as well, then this means I can write trace of phi B in terms of trace of A over phi A and trace of over C of phi C. Okay. So if I have a vector space uh, short exact sequence and I have these two relations, then I can write down the trace in this way. And this is what we're gonna build up from an algebraic structure later on, but it's just linear algebra. Okay, so what's the... Um, um, so how does this work in terms of the, uh, so I want to use this in order to fuse the transfer matrix. And I think this idea really goes back to Kulish and Sklanin, as far as I know. Um, so now suppose I consider the following, again, this is just linear algebra. So I've got a, a following um, short exact sequence and where my intermediate space is a tensor product. Okay. And I want to introduce, use the, introduce this uh, diagrammatics for this and the natural diagrammatics because it turns W into V tensor W is, is a sort of three-legged object. And this is a three-legged object around the other way. And, and because this is a short exact sequence, this means that bubbles of zero, right? Because tau follows the eta in this case. So that, actually, I'm not gonna use that if I compose them. Okay, so suppose we have a short exact sequence and we have this following structure, that the R matrix of V tensor W M, this object is a product, a, a, a composition of this. And, and, and as you know, this is gonna follow from the properties of R matrices and quantum groups. Right? And, but so more importantly, suppose I have the following um, statements um, that I can, um, I can do, um, you know, I, so the outer, so M is just some new vector space. So this acts on, um, this, this is a map from W prime to uh, V tensor W. And this is a, a similar map, but in one case I do outer first and in the other case I do outer after. So it's a bit complicated, but as soon as you draw the diagrammatics, it's clear what's going on. Okay, so that's the diagrammatics. So it doesn't matter whether I embed uh, first, or I, um, uh, or I embed afterwards. So I can move one of these vertical lines through the junction. Get it? So this is sometimes called the bootstrap equation. I think other things are also called the bootstrap equation. But... And then for tau, I want a similar object. And, and again, diagrammatically, I just have this. Corresponding. I can do tau first and then I can act with the R matrix or I can act with two R matrices and then do tau. So if I have these three, these, these four uh, um, properties, then I can do the following. I can take the TV, TW, and which I, is just by definition equal to this. But because of the first property, I can write it like this because I can write the composition of R and, well, this is the composition of the trace of over the tensor product of the composition, but the composition can be written in terms of that. 
but then because of um, the general linear algebra stuff about splitting and traces, I can write that as a, a, a trace over the left-hand side and a trace over the right-hand side. That's what I used before. Okay, and then I can take these two statements here and I can move this iota through using this and this splits up into a trace of W prime over R um, V tensor W, uh, R, R W prime N. So it's this plus this. Did you get it? There's lots of equations and pictures, but all I'm saying is that if we have these three structures and these, you know, commutate these relations of about this injection and projection, a uh, surjection, then this 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 splits up into be as the this split trace plus this trace, and that and Does that's what I mean. Does this have a picture associated with it? Um. Um. Well, it's quite, it's quite hard to draw a picture of, of, of this splitting. It doesn't work in a very nice way. So this is the one thing I don't have a simple picture for. But if I, but I could certainly write a picture of, you know, this, this, and, and this. Uh, but in terms of the derivation, it's not, doesn't obviously help to use pictures of this bit, I think. Because you need to use that splitting of the tracing of a short exact sequence, which doesn't look so nice. Pictorially. So this is the general idea of fusion, and we could so the so why is this fusion? It means we take you know uh, a product of two t's and we get another t out. So it, we kind of fuse these two things and we get other objects out. And and this is how this is the process that's used eventually to get t q is a q prime plus b q double prime. We're just going to choose different auxiliary spaces, right? Okay, here we go. Okay, so. That's the standard picture of fusion. And the, the picture for the fusion of the open transmatrix is not so different. So remember the open transmatrix is this trace, which, which I can write like this. So then I want to fuse two of these objects together. So I can write the, these two objects as this composition and, and I want to use um, fusion of red lines and blue lines. So I need to move them next to each other. So the first thing is to move this blue line up to here. And so I have two lines here and I want to fuse those in this, using the short exact sequence structure. And then I want to fuse the ones on the bottom using the short, another short exact sequence structure. Okay. So you move it so the lines are parallel to each other and then you fuse using short exact sequence structures. And the two short exact sequences I need are for the top, I get the top one, so this is this short exact sequence is here, and this short exact sequence is about the tensor product of the other objects, which is down here. So we need two short exact sequences, one for the top pair and one for the bottom pair. Robert, Robert and why do you call this guy open transfer matrix? Oh, um, so, yeah, okay. So the, the previous is closed because it, um, the right hand side, and where is it? Yeah, so the right hand side is identified by the left hand side. And so it's sort of, it's periodic. Mm -hmm. Whereas this, that's not the case. So the two ends don't talk to each other for this, this transmetrics, okay? Okay. So they're not connected around the back, you know. So, so it, okay. Mm -hmm. so, so it's slightly more obvious when you talk about the Hamiltonian, what you mean by closed and open, but uh, yeah. Okay, so, so I need these fusion relations, but then I need to do something about what the, this pair of boundary objects here. So I need to be able to fuse these as well. So the fusion relations for the boundaries I need, I'm gonna call boundary fusion. And, and diagrammatically, it's easiest to just point them out. You know, I want to, I want to be able to move these eaters and taus around. And so the relations I want oops, diagrammatically on the right are this. Okay, so I can do the, I can, do this injection first and then reflect, or I can reflect first and then do the injection afterwards. And similarly on the left boundary, I can do an injection first, or I can um, and reflect, or I can reflect first and do the injection. And when I write those out, they correspond to these relations. Okay, so, I, so this, um, the one on the right-hand side is this. I just uh, do a simple K-matrix and then I inject, or as on the left, I've got an injection, then I've got two K-matrices and an R-matrix. 
So diagrammatically, these, these are these relations, and this is what I need. So if I can fuse the lines as before, and I can also fuse these boundary terms uh, using these relations, then I can again rewrite the product, the, the composition of uh, transfer matrices in terms of a sum. Mm -hmm. So, that's, that's what I need. Okay, that's the end of my linear algebra. And uh, I know it's kind of a lot to remember, but I'll, I'll refer back to the, uh, the, the, what I need in order to be able to write down TQ relations. And the point is each of these steps is gonna be supplied by the algebraic structure. And that's why um, I'm shifting to now. Yep. May I ask another elementary yes, question? please do. Uh, why it's, uh, why the requirement is that the uh, uh, left-hand side is proportional to the right-hand side? It's not, why is that not say coinciding? Why is it not what, sorry? The... Yeah. So do I understand right that uh, this equation KV plus RV W yeah, this, this one? Are, uh, yeah, so you, well, this alpha is kind of means that left-hand side is uh, yes. kind of proportional to the right-hand side. Yes. Right, so why it's proportional, not equal? Oh, um, um, is it any reason for that or kind of? Well, later on, you'll see algebraically why they're proportional. Um, but at the moment, this is just a necessary condition for commutativity. Be because we consider some projective uh, representation or what kind of? Maybe you hang on and you'll see okay. mm -hmm. where this yeah. comes from in a minute, right? So, so if 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 if, it, if there's some other if there's a number in here that's not one in the equality, all it does is it changes these coefficients down here. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm saying if this is a, this form, then I get this structure. Yeah, yeah. no, is that yeah, yeah. With, with with different coefficients um, coming in. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends a bit on what you choose the yota and the yota bar to be, what these coefficients are. Okay. So let's let's move to the algebraic case. And so of course, you know, R and K come from Quantum groups, right? Which is why I'm speaking in this seminar. And the only case I'm going to look at, because it's the only case we've studied in detail so far, as as usual, is the UQSL two hat case which corresponds to the XXZ Um Okay, so I'm not gonna write down the algebra, but you know, it's given in terms of, I'm, I'm looking at the Chevalier generators as opposed to the Drinfeld realization. So I've got um, a bunch of uh, generators and I've got a bunch of relations of which this is one, but I've got other ones as well. And uh, it's a quasi, trying to get a Hopf algebra. So there's a Hopf algebra structure and I've got a co-product antipode in a co-unit. And just so you can see one of them, here's the co-product I choose. Okay. Um, and well, you know, as you know, there's a universal R matrix, um, uh, which I've tried, attempted to write as curly R here. And the curly R, well, it lives in the algebra sense of the algebra. And um, it obeys um, various axioms, including this one, okay? So this is one of the two axioms of the um, uh, universal R matrix. And so then the idea is um, I can take the universal R matrix and I can get these linear algebra R matrices by taking representations of the universal R matrix over certain representations. So, so now I'm using the notation that pi V is a map from the algebra to endomorphisms of V. So I choose two uh, representations, pi v and pi w, and this, can, this is gonna give me my R matrix, okay? And R check is P times R, and this is an algebra homomorphism thing, okay? So when you swap it around, it's an algebra homomorphism. So that's the standard thing. So that's where the R matrix comes from, you know, you know all that. So what about, okay, so, um, so then what about the um, other relations? Well, now 
we go back to short exact sequences. And I make the assumption now, I, I suppose that there is a short exact sequence, but now this is a short exact sequence of um, UQSL2 hat modules. Okay. So now it generally doesn't split. Uh, but if this exists, and if Iota and Tau are algebra homomorphisms as well, and I choose some other um, uh, representation M, and I have that W prime M and W dou double prime M are irreducible, okay? Um, then I have the following structure. So because of this property of the universal R matrix, I immediately get this, 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 And um, these conditions that I also needed for the, uh, the fusion. So oh, yeah, that's, that was a disaster. I pressed, uh, it's, it's connecting me to Facebook now. Why, why did it do that? Okay, I thought I'd switched everything off, but I didn't switch Facebook off. Okay, so now, the, the, yeah, so this condition comes out from the universal R matrix and these, these come about because essentially of Scherz lemma. So I have an irreducible representation on the left and I have a map into this representation and there's a uniqueness argument that is a sort of version of upgraded version of Scherz lemma for this intertwiner. And so I can write this intertwiner in two ways then they have to be proportional with, a, uh, with some proportionality constant A. Okay. Uh, and again, this other condition because you've identified this intertwiner in two ways, there's a uniqueness argument that tells you these two things have to be the same. So these conditions uh, immediately arise from this existence of this short exact sequence. And for the closed operator, that was all you needed for the, for the closed fusion, right? So all the requirements for fusion come out of the existence of the short exact sequence. So let's, let's give it some representation. So now my V representation is going to be my, uh, it's going to be a two dimensional vector space, the standard sort of fundamental representation, the one that's built in terms, it's the affine representation built in terms of the fundamental representation of SL2. So it's a two dimensional representation. So it's, this is a module over a vector space, which is two dimensional. And this is just the explicit action. So the Chevalier operators act up and down in the usual way. And so then the transfer matrix, the standard transfer matrix of this model is just the trace of the R matrix uh, for some general representation M and over this uh, VZ, right? So that gives you the transfer matrix of the six vertex model, or at least it does if you choose M to be C2 tensor M, right? And so, so yeah, so typically this is a V1 tensor M. Okay, so that's how you get um, uh, uh, the transfer matrix and you get fusion. Um, and um, so what about the Q operator? Well, so I, well, I've said I get you know, fusion whenever I have such a short exact sequence. And I can choose many Ws and W primes and W double W primes. I, so I'm this is really getting on my nerves. Sorry, I'm just gonna switch this off. Okay, it's gone. So the subtlety is I can find lots of UQSL2 hat representations, W and related representations, W prime and W, W prime, such that the short exact sequences are fine. But none of them give uh, the TQ relations of the anticipated form, the UQSL2 representations. In order to be able to reproduce existing TQ relations, you're led to consider infinite dimensional representations, but uh, not of the full algebra, but of a, in a, a wider class of representations of the Braille subalgebra. Okay, so the Braille subalgebra, UQB plus is generated by this subset of gen the generators, and it has a wider class of representations. And in particular, it has um, a representation, which I've written down here, that cannot be upgraded to a full UQSL2 hat representation in any systematic way. Okay. So this is the representation that you're going to, I'm, I'm going to choose. And this is usually called a Q oscillator representation. And the point is 
for this red type of representation, there is a short exact sequence, but it's a UQB plus short exact sequence. So it's a Braille sub algebra short exact sequence, not of the full algebra. But it's still good um, because um, the R matrix still exists for these representations. And that's because the universal R matrix, I said it was in U tends to U, but it's actually in one Borel algebra algebra tends to the other one. So I can get an R matrix by choosing uh, th this wider class of representations of the first spoke. So I choose, so I, so in my first space, I choose not a U representation, but a Borel subalgebra representation, infinite dimensional representation. And then this object uh, still exists and it still satisfies all the properties of the, uh, the R matrix. And uh, so this satisfies these properties, sorry, two, three, four, still the, the, these all hold for this uh, class of representation and uh, where these EOTAs and TAUs are now just UQB plus on you. Um, good. And for the open chain, there's another type of, I need an opposite uh, um, short exact sequence too. So, so what the picture of the closed chain that was finally arrived at, so this is, you know, the, the, the algebraic picture of the Q operator was only arrived at in the late 1990s. There was a gap of 25 years between Baxter and people understanding what the algebraic picture of this was. And that was really came from the work of Zhanov, Lukianov and Zamlochikov. And the picture is, is you take this, you Q oscillator representations of the Braille subalgebra, you look at the R matrix of that, and then you take the trace over that representation. And there's a slight subtlety that this is a trace over an infinite dimensional space. And for convergence, you need to stick in this um, extra factor of T1 to the alpha in here. And this doesn't change the T Q relations for reasons I don't have time to go into, but it makes it convergent. Anyway, you end up with these TQ relations and that, that's how the Q operator of the open, the, the closed chain was constructed long, uh, back in the late 90s. And polynomiality of this follows but by brute force calculations, essentially. There's no simple argument that I know for polynomiality of these algebraic objects. So that's the closed case. So what about the open case? Well, This is what we needed from linear algebra. I'm just going back and I'm reproducing the slide I had earlier. So my transfer matrix, I wanted to be a, a, a double row transfer matrix trace like this. And then I needed the existence of short exact sequences, one for fusing the top pairs of T and Q. So, so Q is gonna be a trace over the red space, okay? So I need to be able to fuse on the top, I need to be able to fuse on the bottom, two short exact sequences. And then I need this reflection equation and I need this boundary fusion. And I need similar stuff on the left. And if I have that, I've got T Q relations. Okay. So if I, if I can do that, I get fusion relations like this. And this is how I want to build the Q operator, but I need to get these relations coming out. So let's, so what's the standard algebraic picture of K? And well, this, this is sort of implicit in Sklenian, although he doesn't quite use this language, but it's, it's there in the original paper, really. So K is a homomorphism between two representations that commutes with a co left co-ideal subalgebra of the quantum group. So A is going to be a left co-ideal subalgebra, which means it's a subalgebra and it has this um, uh, structure. Okay, so the co-product of this gives you the quantum group back tensor A. And then the idea is, is that K is an intertwiner of this co-ideal subalgebra. So the idea is to construct K as an intertwiner of, the, of, of um, uh, this co-ideal subalgebra, which means I have this relation here, some V and V bar. Okay. So then constructing Ks is a question of solving linear relations as it is for R matrices. So you choose your favorite co-ideal subalgebra and you get a K out. And the, the co-ideal subalgebra I'm going to choose very explicitly is this one. You choose three generators and they're given as combinations of the Chevalier generators. So why have I chosen this slightly odd thing? Well, 
when you solve this relation, you get out the simplest possible um, uh, K matrix, which is this, that depends upon Z, but it also depends upon some extra parameters Xi. And it's a diagonal K matrix. So it's the simplest diagonal uh, K matrix, two by two, by two K matrix. And it corresponds to this coedial sub -artery. Right, so that's the picture of K. Now, I now want to choose these infinite dimensional spaces, which are representations of my Borel subalgebra. So what I'd naively like to do is the following. I'd like to view K as an, a coedial subalgebra intertwiner of this form. And if I could do that, I'd, I'd get these critical relations out by uniqueness of homomorphism arguments again. Okay, so I, I write down a, two different um, co-ideal uh, homomorphisms here, and I write down two other co-ideal homomorphisms here, and uniqueness tells me these two things are, um, well, you're gonna ask me why is one equal and why is proportional? Well, it, that can be proportional as well, the first one. Um, so this is what I'd like to do, but there's a, there's a problem with doing this. And the problem is I've got too many damn algebras around. So I've got my quantum group, and then I've got the two Borel subalgebras. And the trouble is, is that the co-ideal subalgebra is not a subalgebra of the Borel subalgebra. Okay, so there's no natural action of the co-ideal subalgebra on these two different Borel subalgebra representations. Okay, so there are four algebras around and the co-ideal structure and the Borel subalgebra structure, one is not a subalgebra of the other one. So I can't find a natural action of the co-ideal subalgebra on the Borel subalgebra models. And, and moreover, this, this essential Stuart's act sequence is for UQB plus modules, not co-ideal subalgebra modules. So I need to get these relations out. I need to find a KW that satisfies these two relations. It's by other means. So what I do is I just brute by brute force solve the first relation. But I can do that because it's still a linear relation for KW because everything else in here is known. So what do you do? We solve this explicitly. And just in case you want to know what it is, my W is an infinite dimensional representation and it's a pretty nice thing. It's a diagonal object and there I have some Q POC hammer symbols coming in. So there's a, you know, this is, this has J terms in this product. So uh, just a question, yep. at some point you, you, got rid of the generality of K, you assumed it was diagonal, and now you're getting out another K, which is diagonal, correct? That's correct, yeah. Um, but that, that, that kind of follows from solving this uh, equation, that there's a diagonal solution. So if my KV- no, no, we, So we know there's a diagonal solution, but you also input somewhere a diagonal solution. Yeah, so I input K, this as my existing diagonal solution. Okay. The two by two matrix, and then I find another diagonal solution on this bigger space. So this is this is a two by two matrix, and this is an infinite by infinite matrix, which is also diagonal. Is it necessary to start with diagonal? Um, no, but it's damn hard to solve this equation if you don't start with a diagonal. In fact, we don't have any solutions of this equation for non-diagonal, and that's a, that's actually a really hard problem. Which is one reason it would be much nicer to solve uh, uh, this relation here in the non-diagonal case, rather than by brute force solving the full reflection equation. But I'll come on to that in a moment. So then, then a kind of miracle happens because we need this relation to be true, where iota was this UQB plus homomorphism, and it is. Which is good because if it wasn't, the whole the setup would be uh, it wouldn't work. But you know, by some miracle, although it's it's probably not a miracle. We under well, there aren't any miracles, and I think we understand probably now why it isn't a miracle. But just we check, and this is true. Which uh, we're just staring at it. There's no obvious algebraic reason for this because this is a um, UQB plus intertwiner, and this um, uh, this isn't. So algebraically, it doesn't make, but as a linear algebra relation, it's true. So that means we're all fine. We've got everything we need and we can write down a T operator. So here's our, a Q operator. So here's our Q operator and it's simply this. So it's this red trace and we have all the relations we need. 
the linear algebra relations, and so we get TQ relations. Okay. And that has certain properties, and we have theorems about this. So first of all, this trace now converges without this extra factor being put, it, put in, which is good because the extra factor in this case would mean that the T's, the transfer matrices would not commute anymore. The argument that tells you transfer matrices commute with these extra um, convergence factors in doesn't work now. And so, you know, to start off with, we, we were slightly worried and lots of people said, you know, it's not going to converge, but actually it converges and this is theorem, which is not the case. In the other case, you need to put in by hand convergence factors. Diagonal elements of polynomial, that's all we have so far, it's a conjecture of off diagonal elements of polynomial. And we proved it for low dimensional uh, uh, quantum spaces, but not in general. And moreover, it reproduces the known beta equations. Okay, uh, which are actually sitting there in Sklianin's work. <clears throat> but of course, this wasn't, the objective of this is not to reproduce the known beta equations, it's to get a general algebraic construction of Q that works in other cases too. I'm almost done. In fact, let me come on to some summary discussion. So uh, what we've got is, we've got a, you know, almost complete algebraic structure in the sense that all the components are algebraic. The bit we don't understand is this equation down here algebraically. But in fact, now having written this first paper, I think we do understand this. And it's, it's slightly subtle. It's that uh, we can write down, um, um, we, we can give W a, a co-ideal subalgebra uh, um, a module structure. And it, but it's independent of the Borel subalgebra structure. So you can just, you can just write down a co-ideal uh, action on this. And then you can get this, uh, but it's not inherited either from the, it's not inherited from the Borel subalgebra structure. So it's an independent action of uh, the co ideal subalgebra on this. And then I think you can obtain these as a purely algebraic object. But, the, 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 but then there's another kind of another miracle because the point is it's the same inter, uh, intertwiners here are also co ideal intertwiners for this different representation. So it, there's still a kind of miracle happening. So these iotas were constructed as UQB plus represent, uh, intertwiners, but on, the co this, on this new representation, they're also intertwiners of the co-ideal subalgebra. So there's another miracle that happens, which we still don't quite understand. But at least we have an algebraic, we, we understand how the four algebras connect to each other now, I think. Okay, um, so then obvious question is, does this hold for non-diagonal uh, K matrices? And Renat's kind of already asked that. And the short answer is we, we don't know because it, this equation is hard to solve. So we can't you know, uh, solve this and check if this is true at the moment. But maybe through this more general picture, we can approach that question. So we clearly want that to be the case. Okay. So this approach should generalize to other um, ranks. Uh, and this is uh, instead of using Q and other algebras, and instead of using Q oscillator representations now, we use these asymptotic or pre-fundamental representations. That's the picture. So these were introduced by Jimbo and Hernandez, and we're also used in a, a context that's similar to the one we've uh, discussed for SL2 by Basayek and Suboy in 2017. What are these asymptotic representations? Well. In the S SL2 case, they're built by taking Verma modules and then scaling those Verma modules uh, such that only a half the action survives and the half the action is the Braille subalgebra action. Mm -hmm. okay. Actually, it's not quite that simple. They, what they, in Hernandez and Jimbo, they, they write down a new algebra, which is the asymptotic algebra, which they obtain from Yuko SL2 two hat by taking asymptotics in a certain way. And then they show there's a, a, a Borel subalgebra uh, representation that's related to those asymptotic representations. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of non-trivial. But, but morally, it comes from taking um, asymptotics of Verma modules. But the point is, these exist uh, for all G, F, I, and G. Okay. So these asymptotic representations. So there is, a, in theory at least, a construction of the closed Q operator uh, for any uh, UQ G hat. Uh, just gonna finish, but so there's, there's an alternative approach to all this. Uh, well, it, 
it's a complementary approach in the closed case, then instead of writing down, looking at short exact sequences, you do something else. And what you do there is you take tensor products of in two different Q oscillator representations. And um, you can um, show that the, um, the trace, well, okay. So the Verma module transfer matrix is related to the product of Q operators over two different Q oscillator representations. And it's slightly subtle how you do this, but nevertheless, you, you can do this. And so then you can understand TQ relations by taking, okay, so this means the Verma module where mu is some arbitrary um, complex number. But if I, um, but then I can take a finite dimensional representation. So now take this as an integer, then I can, um, I can take quotients of Verma modules and get finite dimensional representations. So I can write down transfer matrices of finite dimensional representations in terms of products of Qs and Q bar. And then from that, I can write down TQ relations. So there's a kind of another route. And in paper two, what we're doing is we're showing that this also works in the uh, open case. So we're working on it. And finally, I should, work, I should say there is some existing work, uh, open work on open Q algebraic constructions, although not very much. And the main two references are by Frasak and Sucheny in 2015, who looked at the XXX case. And they looked at a much, I mean, they, their approach was really linear algebra. Uh, and then there's a paper by Derkachev, who um, uh, used this R matrix factorization approach and made some statements relevant to the um, uh, Q operator case for open systems. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank Robert for a wonderful talk. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please ask. Um, and another stupid question. So for SLN, is it uh, kind of uh, this um, uh, item two, is it carried over? Not for item. J, but for SLN. Uh, oh, item two. Yes. So, um, uh, well, for SLN, certainly the, the closed uh, Q operator has been written down using uh, these, these asymptotic uh, representations, but not the open one yet. There isn't any other work on open systems. And uh, really who, who did it for SLM? Um, well, for, for SL3, I think the original paper was by Kojima, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but then for SLN, um, uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember, but SLN has been done okay. um well, so if you want the so the i so i guess the place to understand how these objects are used in q operating instructions is a paper by, by frankel and Hernandez. Mm -hmm. okay, thank uh, you. from i think three years ago mm -hmm. we used the uh, jimbo Hernandez constructions to well to in a in a very categorical way to write down q operators and use this to prove certain conjectures about Q relations between Q characters and TQ relations. Uh, but in that much mm -hmm. bigger paper, there's a discussion of higher rank, uh, higher rank uh, Q operators. Thank you. Other questions? Yep. Hi. I think you're muted. I think. Yes, I had a couple of questions. So can you? Please remind the definition of this coideal subalgebra, just the way it was defined. Um, well, the, sorry, where is it? Because it seems to me quite, I mean, if you realize quantum affine in the loop realization, then those elements Over here. have nice incarnation, I believe. In the loop realization, in the, the Drenfeld, um, I think this yeah. would be a nice, what is called, shifted subalgebra of quantum affine. SA2. So, so which subalgebra? I mean, there is this notion of shifted subalgebras. Shifted subalgebras. Okay. So, I be I think that T zero F one in the loop realization becomes something like E one maybe, or E minus one, like the next loop generator. Yes. So from that perspective, like while your B plus and B minus are kind of Borel subalgebras with respect to dream field jumper decomposition, this should be a nice subalgebra with respect to this 90 degree rotated picture. 
where you have triangular decomposition with respect to new Greenfield realization. Because low subalgebras have generalization to any type and they are always co-ideal subalgebras. So my, question, my original question was how, do you, how would you define the subalgebra outside of SL2? Do you have a, an explicit presentation? So there is an explicit construction of um, uh, co-ideal subalgebras and associated uh, k-matrices, and that is actually the, the, the most complete version of that is in a paper by my collaborator, actually, which is Bard Vla. Uh -huh. So they did classification of co-ideal subalgebras using Sitake diagrams. Okay. Um, that maybe it's related to new Greenfield relation. And another question, can you please go back to the last slide? Before the last slide of the talk rather than... Yes. So when you, so I kind of lost the track. So when you say this T mu is proportional to Q times Q bar, yes. does it mean that on the left hand side you kind of have Verma kind of non-degenerate solution, while on the right-hand side, you have more degenerate solutions of RTT relation, something like that. So, 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 so what? So what you have is there's there's um um you know there's an isomorphism behind this. So what you have is you take a product of uh, two Q oscillator representations of the Borel um, subalgebra, uh -huh. uh, and you find that this is isomorphic to the um, uh, an, an, another product of two Borel's infinite dimensional Borel subalgebras, one of which is uh, the Verma module, mm -hmm. it has, it's, and, and another one which is, is, is a trivial representation of the Q oscillator algebra. So one of the Chevalier generators is a step operator, and the other one is zero. Okay, so it's a it's a, it's a direct isomorphism between infinite two infinite products of a Q oscillator algebra and two other infinite products of Q oscillator representations, which is okay, sl slightly odd, but, it, but it's, uh, and, and when you take the trace over the, the new uh, tensor products, then you get the trace over the Verma module plus the trace over the trivial representation, and the trace over the triple representation, it, trivial representation is proportional to the identity. Mm -hmm. Do so you know get... it's related to the really series of papers by Bajanov, Minigeli, Frasek, and other collaborators. So what they do is on the language of RTT presentation, they construct so-called degenerate solutions of RTT. So for example, they say that the usual non-degenerate solution coming from Fermat module, it factors exactly as a product. Yes, example. no, this is directly related to that. Exactly. This factorization of the R matrix uh, issue, yeah. So the, pa the place where it's explained what the connection between their picture and the kind of this picture is, is in a paper by um, a recent paper by Hiroshkin and Suboy. They, mm -hmm. they explain this very nicely. They, they, first of all, they kind of explain the R matrix factorization algebraically, and they also say what the connection between with this statement is. So Hiroshkin and Suboy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, any other questions? When you write TQ relations, uh, first and closed case, am I right that this A and B coefficients that you have, you can compute from the universal R matrix? You, you can. Uh, it's a hard way to do it. I mean, so the way that we did it was just by constructing um, R matrices, not as representations of universal R matrix, but just by solving intertwining conditions. And then we, um, and then these A and Bs uh, come out uh, by, sorry, I'll get there eventually. So let's look at the, um, yes. So, so then we, we construct both sides here, this and this by solving intertwining conditions. And then we simply read off what this A is and this B is. So we never actually use the universal R matrix. Mm. Does so you, you calculate for certain for certain m. So they do not depend on m. Yes. So uh, no, these. Uh, okay. So they do depend upon m. Yes. Yes, they do. So we we choose um, m here to be um, well the two-dimensional representation of UQSL two hat, 
and then this tells us what this A is because we compute everything else here. And then we can take tensor products of those. It just tells us we get A to the N coming in as a factor. We take M as V to the N. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm. If you're an expert on universal R matrices, you could indeed compute this, uh, but, uh, but life is too short to actually use the universal R matrix to compute anything explicit. So it's far easier just to solve intertwining conditions. So you just compute left side and right side and then? Yep. Okay. Robert, and can you say once again, uh, like, uh, what is in Horoshkin subway and how it is related to, to the discussion here? I, I got a little lost there. Um, yeah, I can attempt to, but uh, let me uh, get another page up. Hang on, sorry. So Horoshkin and Suboy, they look at two different Q oscillator representations. Oh, hang on, I need the W and W bar. Okay, mm -hmm. and these, these are analogous to, these are infinite dimensional representations. And, and what they find is that as a UQB plus module, this is isomorphic to the Verma module, tends uh, some other Q oscillator representation. So these are a UQB plus isomorphism between a two Q oscillator representations, the Verma module and a trivial Q oscillator representation. But, but these are actually the UQG hat, right? Of of the Borel subalgebra of U Q S L two hat in their case, yeah. okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the night the surprising thing is is what the uh, is is what this map is. Okay, so let's call this to confusion. Let's call it map. So it's, so this the, so you can write down. Um, so they write down two different Q oscillators. So they have A1, A1 dagger, and, and some D, where these are Q oscillators. And then they have A2, A2 dagger, and D2. And this, this is amazingly simple, this operator, this isomorphism. O, o is simply this. It's a Q squared exponential of A1 tends to A2 dagger, mm -hmm. minus Q minus Q inverse. So this. This maps this to this, I suppose. But this is almost like uh, like expression for the for the R matrix for this or two. Well, not purely in terms of well, it's sim simpler than the expression for the R matrix, but and but the expression for R matrix is well, it's cart time part, and then you have Q exponential of E tensor F times Q minus inverse. Well, in the final, yeah, I mean, but it, you have influenced some in there in that case. Uh, so this is just a single term. Wait, no, for SL2 it's the whole thing, no? Uh, it will time the carton. Well, well if, you, if you look at, I think maybe you're talking about finite dimensional No, the, the, Well, I mean, okay, I know how A1 and A2 dagger act, but, but, but the, their expression for the inverse R matrix for SL2, UK SL2, it's Q exponent of E tensor F will time that constant, right? Times the well, Q to the H tensor H bar, uh, sorry, H tensor H. Um, uh, it's a fine, it's also. Yeah, this is F, affine. It's a, so the infinite product of such terms. Yeah, it's an infinite product. In there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, yes. No, you're for sure right. Yes. So this is this is just a single yeah. object, mm -hmm. and it's just a Q exponential, and uh, and yet it does this miraculous transformation, and so you, this is so when you take the trace over these, you get you know Q Q bar, and then you get the trace over this, which is this T mu. And then you get the identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. I see. And this is associated with this factorization of the R matrix as well. Because so it tells you that the R matrix of the Verma module is associated with the product of R matrix over, over W and W bar. And then you get this trivial factor that comes in as well. Uh -huh. So that's the Durkachoff picture of the factorization of the R matrix written in this language. Mm -hmm. I had this like poorly formulated question. Uh, he, he has papers about this open XXZ uh, and, uh, and um, key operators there, but he also has something about uh, open TODA key operators there. 
do you know how like is there a similar picture to what you were describing for the for the TODA system? Yeah, I can't really say anything the sensible, there. sensible on that. Uh, Sorry? I, mean, I, I can't really say anything sensible on that, I'm afraid, in terms of the key operator. <laughs> Are you thinking of classical, the integral system? No, I'm thinking of quantum integral system. Quantum. Okay. Um, any other questions? So I have a very uh, silly question. Uh, here you uh, say that V is a Verma module, but I thought yeah. before when we construct oh. T operator, we take something like C2, so we do finite dimensional modules. Yeah, so this, this is a Verma module now. So this, this, this transfer matrix is a transfer matrix of a Verma module. But if I take this now as a, a in integer and I take um, uh, this, so I take the, the quotient okay. of two Verma modules. So then we this need is to take a, difference. This is a finite thing now. So I end up with that this is equal to Q Q bar plus some other Q Q Q um, Q Q bar or minus, sorry, some factor in here. My pen is frozen. So, so naively I get something like this. So this doesn't look like T Q, but but if it does, when you combine it with the Q determinant expression, so I multiply both sides by Q, then use the Q determinant expression, and this simplifies and gives TQ relations. So this implies TQ is Q plus Q. Okay. But Thanks. using the T, the. Questions? Okay, well, if there's no other questions, let's thank Robert again for a wonderful talk indeed. Um, thank you. And Thanks, Robert. Yeah, that was the, I guess, the last time of the semester. So ah. hopefully, uh, we'll see you next year somewhere. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> okay, well, it was nice to see you all even if remotely and hopefully i see some of you in reality at some point hopefully in the future recording